thank you for picking up this book entitled The Winning Attitude. This is the Father's Day message delivered by Ray Miller, my husband, to his congregation on June 21st, 1998. Tragically, Ray was struck by a van while jogging three days later. I think you will find that this message reveals his love for equipping and empowering people with the tools and motivation to carry out their responsibilities. Attitude, passion, and commitment. You will hear how they work together to produce a lasting change. But I'm speaking specifically to dads today because this is Father's Day. And the title of the message is The Father's Greatest Gift, Attitude, Passion, and Commitment. Would you look in your notes as I read our scripture together for us, a familiar scripture for most of us from the book of Malachi. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. I want you to consider the implications of that verse just for a few minutes. Notice it does not say that he is going to first turn the hearts of the children towards the fathers, but he's going to first turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the hearts of the children towards the father, lest he come and smite the land with a curse. Now, Time does not allow me to go into all of the implications of that scripture, except to say that unless you understand the principle of fatherhood, you don't understand the implications of that scripture. Fatherhood, for whatever reason, is the primary um, ingredient, if you will, that produces security in our children. I'm not even, I don't even want to go there and list the many reasons why our culture is where it is, but without listing all that is wrong with our culture, at the, at the top or the bottom of the list, one of the primary causes is the breakdown between the relationship with a father and his children. The average father spends 37 seconds a day talking to his child. 37 seconds a day, speaking to his child. It is fatherhood, that, and motherhood as well, but, but I'm, I'm speaking today to dad, so let me be imbalanced, all right? It's fatherhood that produces a sense of uh, self-worth and self-esteem in your children. Dads, uh, I, I'm going to touch on the notes, and we're going to go through it, but... When, when God speaks about the heart, there's three aspects of the heart that we're going to talk about this morning. Attitude, passion, and commitment. Now, Dad, what you say to your children is secondary, is minimal compared to what you are in front of your children. If you as a dad do not capture the heart of your children, I don't care if they go to church every Sunday, every Sunday night and every Wednesday night and read their Bible every day, you haven't captured their heart. Just doing, just doing what dad says is not the same thing as me having worked with my children and all of a sudden one day I know I've got their heart. I've got it. Turn the hearts of the father towards the children and the hearts of the children towards their father. I want to talk about that this morning. Attitude, passion, and commitment are three characteristics or three areas that are heart issues. Attitude is the ground in our lives that stuff is sown into. I use the word stuff for lack of a better word. I'm not talking just about spiritual stuff or spiritual things. I'm talking about stuff. Stuff gets sown into your life all the time. Every single day, things happen. Attitude is like the garden in your life. Even seeds of the kingdom, listen to me, even seeds of the kingdom won't change your attitude. It's your attitude. 
It's not God's attitude. God has a great attitude. I said last Sunday to this to this service, I keep forgetting. Um, I didn't say it to the early service. I did today. But I told you last Sunday, I'd rather hang around a sinner with a good attitude than a follower of Christ with a bad attitude. I really would. Attitude is is the is is the ground of your life from which you view life and live your life. Many of you spend a fair amount of time in front of the mirror before you go out to meet the public. And that's important. Some of you don't think it's that important. We recognize that you don't think it's that important. <laughs> okay. You can be very attractive in your physical appearance, but if you've got an ugly attitude, you're ugly. You're repulsive towards people. In fact, you repel people, even though you're very attractive in your physical appearance. And you may not be that attractive in your physical appearance, but you've got a great attitude, and you know what? You attract people. Attitude makes all the difference in the world. Now listen to me, Dad, talking to you primarily today. Attitude, or the right attitude, is the atmosphere wherein your children will grow. One of the first things you got to do, Dad, if you want to have children that are going to succeed in life, is you got to, at an early age, put a 10 on their forehead, if 10 is the best. What you expect from your children is what they will give you. If you put a four on their forehead, they're going to become a four. If you put a ten on their forehead, they're going to strive to be a ten. You've got to believe in your children. You've got to put a ten on their forehead. Now let me give you some examples of this. What I'm talking about is a winning attitude. God's a winner. God dwells in perpetual enthusiasm. He does. He wants that in us. He said, I've come to give you abundant life. Now, winners, the difference between winners and losers. Losers have a long list of excuses of why they can't do whatever it is they've been asked to do. Winners have thrown away the excuses. I love sports. One of the reasons I love sports is, is that whole aspect of attitude. And if, if, if you don't watch sports, forgive me, I'm going to use this as an, an illustration. But how many of you watch the NBA playoffs? A few of you. The rest of you will get saved one of these days and watch them. <laughs> uh, I'm a big Michael Jordan fan. There's 15 seconds left in game six. The Utah Jazz is winning by one, and they call a timeout. Over in the Utah huddle, Coach Sloan is looking at his five players, and he is saying this to them, keep the ball away from Michael. It's a minute and 20 seconds in the huddle, and they're looking at each other, and they're saying, keep the ball away from Michael. That's the whole strategy. Keep the ball from Michael. Over in the other huddle, Coach Jackson for the Bulls has got his team huddled, and Steve Kerr, who I also like, last year at the playoffs, and this is a fact, I heard him say it, last year at the playoffs, if you remember, Steve Kerr hit the three-pointer with a couple of seconds left, and they won the game, won the championship. Steve Kerr says to Coach Jackson, he says, hey, look, last year I did it, how about drawing up a play and getting me the ball again this year. Jackson says, that was a fluke last year, Steve Kerr. Get the ball to Michael and get out of the way. That's what he said to him. So in the Bulls huddle, Coach Jackson is saying, get the ball to Michael. Get the ball to Michael. And Michael is saying, give me the ball. Give me the ball. So, they blow the whistle. If you watched it, you saw it. Somehow, some way, 
Michael Jordan gets the ball. Chuck Jansen and I were talking about it. Chuck said, and if you saw it, he faked out his defender. Chuck said he had enough time to read the stock market before he took the shot. Stood there, man, nobody around, took a shot from the foul line, dead center, nothing but net, and won the game. Coach Jackson the next day said, turns to Michael and said, thank you for carrying us on your shoulder one more time to a championship. Michael said, the difference between me and all the others, and I believe he's a man among boys on the basketball court, is I have a passion for the game and for winning. And when I lose the passion, I never want to play again. He says, I don't, Michael Jordan said, I have no problem with anybody failing, but I've got a whole lot of problem with somebody not trying. The right attitude. Listen, the game was won before the game was ever begun. I'll use, Stuart told me I can use this illustration in his own life. I'm an, a coach for Stuart's team. We are 9-0, and folks. We won the championship Thursday night. We've got two more games. If we win them all, we'll be 11-0. and It's the first time in 20 years that a team from Mespo has won the championship. All right? Glory to God. God is good, and they had great coaches. Okay. Uh, Stewart has been pitching this year. One of the reasons I've been involved in him, in, in his life in sports, is because you can teach life principles. It's what I'm after more than anything else. So this year, he's a great pitcher. He really is. He's got great ability, but he doubted his ability. He doubted it. Just, and so the thing that I worked with more than anything else was mental toughness. So the last time he went, had an outing, he had a really bad inning. I mean, he walked players. He hit players. They got hits. And I think the opposing team got about four runs. And I'm standing on the sideline. I'm a coach. And I'm yelling out there, come on, son. Throw strikes. Throw hard. Mental toughness. Stay focused. And he comes running in and says, Dad, would you not tell me to stay focused and have mental toughness? Because everybody else can hear it. You just say that to me privately. I said, I'm sorry, son. Sorry. But I said, you understand what I mean? He says, oh, yeah, I understand it. And I had talked to him about having the look of a winner. How many of you remember Oral Hershiser for the Cleveland Indians last year? His nickname is called the Bulldog. He's a believer. And when Oral would get determined to win, he'd have that look in his face. And the opposing team would go, oh, no. Same kind of look that Michael Jordan had. And I talked to Stewart about the look of the Bulldog, meaning you've had enough. Now it's time to get serious and determined. And so he goes out in the next inning, and, you know, the coach and I are standing beside each other. We're a little nervous because he's had a really shaky outing his first inning. He throws his practice throws, and he gets ready to face the first player. And I told him, I said, walk off the mound, talk to yourself, and get back up there on the rubber. And He walks off the mound. He steps up on the rubber. I looked at his face. And I turned to my coach and said, we can go and sit down. It's all over. He said, what do you mean? I said, he's got the look. He's got the look. Pitched the next two innings. Nobody got a hit. Six outs in a row. He came in after the, that first inning, got three outs in a row. And I said, Stuart, what happened out there? He said, I got off the mound and talked to myself and said, I'm not going to walk one more batter. They're going to have to work really hard to get a hit off of me. The battle is won before the game is ever begun. I put a 10 on my son. You're a 10. Now come on. The right atmosphere is, is you have to create the right atmosphere that is conducive for growth. If you're constantly critical, if you're constantly judgmental, if you are constantly tearing them down, if you're constantly relating to them as though they're a four, they're not going to disappoint you. They're going to be a four. Now, Dad, you've got to hear something else. That's a principle that you've got to understand, which is why everybody wants to play basketball with Michael Jordan. Because when you play with a ten, he makes a four. If you're a four, he'll pull you up to be a seven. If you want your children to be tens, Dad, you got to become one. 
One of the things that happens to us when we graduate from high school, we've worked hard in high school, we applied ourselves, and I know guys that I graduated with that were on the up on the upper scale, eight between eight and tens. They graduated from high school, they stopped, they went from an eight to a four. I was a four in high school. That's that's about the best that I was. When I graduated from high school and I got around some tens, I said, I understand now what it takes to become one. One of the tragedies is, if you're not working at being a 10, your children are going to become what you are in terms of 1 to 10. Your children catch who you are. If you've got a bad attitude, they're going to pick up on it. They catch far more than we teach them. Attitude. It constantly needs to be adjusted. It's like what the farmer said. The hardest thing about milking cows is they never stay milked. A good attitude has to be worked at. Having the right attitude, you have to work at it all the time. I'm going to be teaching on attitude, but one of the things, listen, you want to be a loser? Don't hang around me. I don't want to hang around losers. You've got a long list of reasons why you can't do it? Get rid of the list. Attitude is a choice. You can change your attitude. Attitude determines your approach to life. Attitude more than anything else affects the outcome. The battle is won before the battle is begun. That's a good little phrase to memorize. It's not original with me. Just this week, I read a little article. I love sports figures, as you can tell. Yeah, I, I, I don't like everything that our society's done to it and all of that. But listen, John Elway, he's another guy that many Cleveland fans, you know, and some Christians have to repent for hating him because he beat us so many times in football. John Elway said this. He said, I begin preparing for the next season in April. He said, I, I do physical workout for four hours a day. But he said, my physical workout is secondary to my mental workout because I must work myself into having the winning attitude. He says, without that, I don't win. The right attitude. Now, let me give you, you have an acrostic in your, in your, in your uh, notes. Dads, you've got to build this into your kids. Obviously, you're going to have to spend time with them to do it. But here's this word problem. P stands for predictor. Every problem is a predictor of of whether you're going to succeed or lose at life. It depends on how you approach the problem. Listen to me. I don't have problems. I refuse to identify myself with a problem. The moment you say, I have problems, you're part of the problem. I don't have problems. I have to deal with problems in life, and problems are food for me. But I don't have a problem. I'm a problem solver. So I know in this life there will be problems. They're not my problems. They're not your problems. They're problems. And it, your approach to a problem predicts whether you're going to succeed or fail in life. And you've got to have this in your children. Every CEO of Fortune 500 companies have said attitude is 70% of what makes somebody succeed or fail in anything in life. I know they're not believers, but some of them are. Attitude. It's a predictor. Number two, remind, R stands for reminder. It reminds you and me that life is difficult and we need help. I need help from Owen. Owen needs help from me. I need help from my wife Mary. She needs help from me. We need help from each other to maintain the right attitude towards a problem. We need help from God. It's a reminder. I need help. Because I'm not going to let the attitude win over me or the problem win over me. O stands for opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity. Listen to me. If everybody who invented anything had the attitude that I can't solve the problem, nothing would have been invented. Every invention was born out of a problem. Every problem is an opportunity. Opportunity to find a solution. B, every problem is a blessing. The Bible is very clear that we grow through trials and tribulation. There's growth that comes through them. So every problem is a blessing. You're about to grow if you will learn from it. L stands for lesson. Every problem is a lesson. 
The question is, are we teachable? Do you have the right attitude about a problem? Or, if you have the wrong attitude, the wrong attitude says, I'm going to get out of this problem. The right attitude says, I'm going to figure out a way to fix it. I'm going to fix it. E stands for everybody. Everybody has to deal with problems. The only time you're not going to have to deal with problems is when you die. And then I'm not sure what's going to happen in the age to come. Every problem, M, is a message. That's all it is. It's a message. Like the little indicator lights on the dashboard in your car. Listen to me. You're driving down the road. The light comes on that says you're low in gas. All that is is an indicator. You don't have problems. You just need a gas station. Problems are indicators. You don't have a problem. The light just went on. What's it trying to tell you? It's a message. Find out what it's pointing at. If you don't understand the light going on on the dashboard of your car and it's low in gas, you may pull over and say, I've got to buy me a new car. Why? i got a light on here. i got a problem. No, you need a gas station. And yes, every problem is solvable. Every problem is solvable. Now, three things, because we've got to move, three things that affect us in our attitudes in a negative way. Listen to me carefully. They're in your notes. Destination disease. Destination disease says, if I could only live there, if I could only move there, if I could only, I'd be happy. Someone sickness says, if I could only marry that knight in shining armor, he's tall, he's dark, he's handsome, and when he comes along, I'll be happy. Or she's this beautiful blonde and when she comes along, I'll be happy. No, you won't. The last one is backslider blues or, or preoccupied with the past and the failures of the past and saying if I'd only wouldn't have done that, if I'd only chose somebody else in marriage, if I'd only, if I'd only, if I'd only, I'd be happy. Listen to me. Happiness, your happiness is not dependent on external things, but on internal things within you personally. Fix it. Dad, your children are not responsible to you for your happiness. Children, your dad is not responsible to you for your happiness. Wife, your husband is not responsible to you for your happiness. Husband, your wife is not responsible to you for your happiness. Congregation, your pastor is not responsible to you for your happiness. That's your business. That's your responsibility. Fix it. You've got to create the right atmosphere in your home that is conducive to growth within your children. And if you put nines and fours and threes on your children's forehead and you don't call them up, you don't call them up, put a ten on them and then begin to work to see them become what you're saying. Okay, the second thing that we need, and we got to go, it's only 11 o'clock, we're doing good. Passion. Passion. Quickly, let me give you the things to fill in here. Children need passionate fathers. People are influenced by reason. They are inspired by passion. Passion is the birthplace of a dream. Passion turns a dreamer into a doer. And... See, passion ensures resolve. If you're passionate about something, you have stick to itness until you see it come to pass. Dad, go home today. If your children are old enough, sit them down and ask them the question What, by the way, Dad lives, what is Dad passionate about? 
See, Dad, they catch your passion, and they'll, they'll tell you if they're going to be really honest. Whatever you are passionate about is the thing your children are going to be able to recognize. If your children aren't old enough, go ahead, go ahead and ask your spouse. And if she's really honest, she'll tell you, and perhaps it's exactly what you wanted to hear. Ask them, what are you passionate about? What am I passionate about? Listen to this. This is an example of a passionate man. John Wesley wrote this in his diary. I preached this morning at 6 a.m. to 1,200 ministers, and they threw me out of the church. I preached again the same day at 10 o'clock in the morning to a crowd, and it was completely unsuccessful. I preached that afternoon at 2 p.m., and the people who heard me hated me. I preached again at 5 p.m., and the response was negative to what I had to say. I preached at 10 p.m. that evening, and 150 people got saved. Praise God, the ritualistic church was not there to get in my way. That's passion, folks. That's passion. What is it that you are passionate about? It makes the big difference. Here's another story of a man who was passionate and committed. See, whatever you're pa passionate about, Dad, and the rest of you, all of us, is the thing you're committed to. Whatever is your passion is the thing you're committed to. Michelangelo, sculptor and painter, this is what was said about him. Although he possessed great talents, his accomplishments and fame came only after he had invested himself to the point of physical exhaustion. Michelangelo spent years lying flat on his back on a scaffolding, painting the fresco in the Sistine Chapel. By the time he completed this magnificent project, he was virtually blind from all of the paint that had dripped in his eyes. Because Michelangelo was willing to invest himself with passionate commitment, his creations today have been admired for more than four centuries. Pretty amazing. What are you passionate about, Dad? What's the passion that's burning in your heart? Isn't it amazing that when God wanted to start a movement among men, He did not go and choose a minister or a pastor, but He went out and found a passionate coach called Coach Mac or MacArthur start promise keepers. Why? Because the passion that burned in him is the thing that will inspire others. That's the thing that's going to get capture the heart of your children. There, there are some people that I'm tempted sometimes to just walk up to them, and Eli is not one of them. This is a, at 78 years old, he's one of the most passionate older men that I know. Passionate about the things of God. Passionate about walking two miles a day. I mean, he's just passionate about life. I love it. But there are some people who I want to walk up to them and say, do you know that you're boring? You're vanilla, man. See, passion is the thing that spices up relationships. When there's no passion that is being transferred between you and your child, there's very little there. There's very little there. If all you're giving them is information, information's not going to cut it, man. It's not going to cut it. Because some they're going to be a, they're going to be attracted to somebody with passion. I've already seen somebody passionate about what they're about and they were dead wrong, but they had my attention. What had me? Their passion. Passionate. What are you passionate about? What makes you tick, man? you got to discover what that is. And if it isn't the right thing, God is able to change it. Okay, last one is commitment. Commitment is born out of passion. Passion is born out of the right attitude. Commitment, A, it is the foundation of every great movement and generation. B, it is the making of every great person. It is the making of every great person. Dad, you got to be building commitment into your children. 
again, using the example of Stewart, you know, in baseball. And he wants to be a fabulous baseball player whenever he plays a game. He doesn't really want to practice, but he just expects to be fabulous when he gets out there to play the game. But he's got to be committed to the, to the work. So it's a great lesson to teach. It's the same thing for us. We have to be committed to the work in order to be successful. Commitment, C, is the difference maker between the good and the great. D, commitment is the major influencer in the lives of most people. E, it is the core of courage that every great person must possess. The greatest gift a father can give his children is to possess a winning attitude regarding life and regarding them. Secondly, to have a burning passion in his heart for God demonstrated by his commitment first and foremost to God and his purposes. God is very passionate about what he does in our lives. See, the thing about God is that when you came to him, and the thing that is so thrilling about walking with God is God, when you came to him, he put a tent on your forehead, Jim Simpson. And he says, Holy Spirit, work in him. Make it happen. He's pulling us. He's working, Phil, to make you a 10, man. Because he says, I know who you are, and you're a 10. And the Holy Spirit is loose in you. He says, I'm working so that what Father said about you becomes a reality in your life. You're a 10. You're a 10. That's what we need to do with our children. God dwells in perpetual enthusiasm about us. Oh, we disappoint him at times. But he says, that's all right. I got to discipline you. Yeah, because you blew it. But man, come on. Let's get down back on the road again. Let's get back on the road. I want all the dads to come up here and stand here this morning. But I want to say something to you dads. You're the most important and, and ladies, just listen to me. It doesn't, I'm not at all discounting who you are. You're the most important ingredient in this body. This, as you, as we go, because I stand among you, as we go, so goes this church. One thing I like about this church is we got manly men in this church. But manly men is not enough. We need godly men. And we got godly men here. I want you to realize something. As you turn and look out there, they're watching us. Not just your children, but this body is watching us. Leadership is influence. We're called to be leaders in this body. We influence it by our passion, our attitude, and our commitments. That's how you influence your children. That's how you influence people. I want to call us all up. I'm standing with you even though I'm standing here. I want to call us up to a right attitude, a godly passion, and deep commitments in our lives. I want us to be able to say to all of them out there, grab a hold of our belt loop. Because we know where we're going. We're passionate about it. We're committed to the things of God. We've got the right attitude. And if you come with us, man, we're going to show you some things about walking with God. We're going to win. We're going to win. So I'm going to pray for us because I stand with you. I love you guys. I love this group of men in this church. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I do. I love you guys. I love the manliness about us. I do, man. I do. And I, I think it's a gift from God. But I also want to put a mantle on all of you to realize we're the leaders here. They're watching us. Let's be godly men together. And we need each other. 
I need you guys. We need each other. We need to be an encouragement, a place of accountability. We need to be prayer partners. We need to stand with one another. We need each other. We're going to pray, and then we're going to do something else. Let's pray together right now. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you for these dads. There's not a dad standing here. There's not a man standing here who is unable to say I've blown it at times, both in my role as a father as well as my role as a man. We want to declare this morning we are not going to grovel in our failures. We're not going to get down into that junk. We're going to pick ourselves up and we're going to say, Father, brush us off. Help us to learn from where we failed and now set our feet on the right path. We accept the responsibility as men in this household. We accept the responsibility of leadership. We accept the fact that others are watching us and looking at us. We accept that responsibility for who we are. Now where we need to change, change us, Holy Spirit. Where we need to grow, Grow us up, Holy Spirit. Where we need to adjust things in our life, do it for us. Not just for our own sake, but for the sake of our children, for the sake of this congregation, and for the sake of the generations that are to come after us. Knit us together, God. Help us to find each other, to be an encouragement to each other, to be a strength to each other in this day and in this hour that we could stand firm in our, in our commitment to you, in our commitment to one another, in our commitment to our family, in our commitment to this church. In Jesus' name, we ask these things and we say thank you for the responsibility of manhood, fatherhood, of being a dad. We accept it. We do not shrink back from it. In Jesus' name, amen.